nice announcement. We have a new member here at the FISC. Uh, Jose Javier Namasco has been joining us recently for the next three years. He came with a high postdoc uh, fellowship. And uh, his expertise is uh, in networks, complex networks. He did his PhD uh, at IFCA in Santander. Then he had different postdoctoral studies, one uh, in uh, Porto in Portugal, uh, one in uh, Atlanta, Emory University. And for the last four years, he's been working in beautiful Torino at the Easy Foundation. <laughs> yeah, I'm cool. <laughs> And uh, he's actually quite interested in how you can infer on the network structure from the network dynamics, uh, on applications of network dynamics, and also applications to online networks uh, and social networks. And so we're looking forward uh, to working with you. And you can find him in Office 104. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, once more, welcome. I will. Thank you. <laughs> and also, welcome to our speaker today, who is an eternal, if I may say so. Uh, <laughs> David Zukov uh, is a, a professor of Washington and Lee University, uh, but he has been joining us for a sabbatical stay for one year. Uh, he's here with us since, well, end of August or beginning of September, however you want to count it. Um, and so he did his PhD with Dan Garcier at Duke University in the US. Uh, the title was uh, Experimental Control of Instabilities and Chaos in Fast Dynamical Systems. That's also where its famous paper on uh, fast dynamical systems, a highly cited paper on fast uh, control of dynamical systems, uh, dates back to. Um, and uh, after he got his PhD at Duke, he went for a few years of postdoc until 1999 uh, to the Nonlinear Optics Center at uh, the Albuquerque Air Force Base. That's also the first time we tortured lasers together. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, he went uh, for a professor position in 1999 at Washington D University, where he's uh, until now. Uh, originally, he contacted uh, me to have a beautiful one-year stay in Edinburgh. Uh, <laughs> at that time, I was about to move here, so uh, I tried to convince him that Palma is a nicer place to come. <laughs> uh, and finally, he agreed. <laughs> and I'm very happy to have you here. And looking forward to your seminar, giving us a bit of insight uh, what he has been working on during the last years, uh, and uh, well, he's, uh, his door is always open uh, in case you're interested. Also, discuss these kind of subjects with him, and you can find him often in our labs. Meanwhile, uh, and he's going to give us a presentation on his mostly experimental work, but also mm -hmm. some nice modeling on dynamics of semiconductors with often orthogonal optical feedback. Thank you, Ingo, for the very kind introduction. And I also want to say thank you to everyone here at this that has uh, welcomed me, both for um, the uh, stimulating science that I've already encountered, as well as the you know, fine colleagues and you know, welcoming character of the place. It's really been a pleasure. So I'm looking forward to you know, going from here forward. But at this point, I'm going to look back, uh, tell you some of the things that I've worked on uh, more recent or in the recent past, and uh, we'll leave it to Miguel in future conversations uh, to what we're doing here now. But okay, now to go through the uh, perfunctory acknowledgement slides. Um, certainly, our home institution Leo has covered very nicely. Um, I did. I should acknowledge when he says I'm, I'll be presenting mostly experimental work. What he means, in, in a very nice way, is that when I present the numerics or the Analytics, and it will come from one of these gentlemen, and I will be reproducing as well as I can. Uh, um, I'm sure those are recognizable names. Many of you, uh, Tom Gavrilides, who was in Albuquerque at the time, now in London, and Tomat, who I think several of you have known and worked with extensively at Process. Uh, I also need to acknowledge the people who have paid and housed and so forth. So, of course, National Science Foundation, uh, Tomat has been supported by FNRS. Um, me being here is a 
I guess a joint venture in scholarship between Washington and William at this. Thanks to all of them. Thanks also to the people who did the work in the summers. Uh, what you may not know, Washington and Lee is a purely undergraduate school along with a small law school attached, thus the university designation rather than the college. Um, so all of these are my uh, research student summer groups who have worked um, with me for two, three months in, in summer times and then continued on during the year. Um, but so we have, look at those, those, those happy people. There's another group, they're also happy. They continue to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you'll be as happy as they are, by the, or as happy as they appear <laughs> through the course of this seminar. OK, here is my ambitious agenda, so I'll try not to meander too much. Uh, first, I'd like to just give you an overview of polarization rotated optical feedback or orthogonal optical feedback. Uh, go into single laser studies first, uh, delay the groundwork, and get an idea of how this stuff works. Uh, talk about the experimental effects and particularly the square waves, of which I've become particularly fond. Uh, and then talk about the modeling, some simulations and analytics to go with it. After that, we will expand, generalize to a double laser system with mutual coupling, and sort of go through the same routine and show you some of my favorite results, favorite modeling. And then uh, try to actually, after we've built up to the full model, maybe if we have time, try to work back to some more simple things to give us guidance about the things we don't understand yet. Um, of which there are several. All right, so very quick overview. Here are, here's the first set of the smorgasbord of possible configurations for optical perturbations. We presumably could have larger blue boxes indicating lasers, and so you could have injection from one to another. You could have a very thin mirror here just indicating external feedback, time delay feedback. You could have two lasers mutually injecting with the <coughs> Um, these are sort of first order things that we could study and learn. Um, my work is going to be uh, more involving places where we have a rotator in the middle by some means. And we have the orthogonal injection, one rotated, one laser whose field is rotated and injected to the other. We can have a rotator intracavity so that the laser is emitting in one mode and receiving feedback in another. Or we could have this mutual coupled delay case. These two are the ones that I'll be spending my time with you in this seminar. All right, so I was going to call this OOF for orthogonal optical feedback. But instead, we went for the more appealing PROF. Now, when you're thinking PROF and you know, nonlinear optics, you probably are thinking you know, some of our senior colleagues here. <laughs> uh, you might be thinking of other senior colleagues. <laughs> you might, if you were new to Mallorca, be thinking of the archetype of 13th century scholarship. Um, Ramon Newell and his book of science, which I have only recently learned, is part of the logo here. So you might be thinking of these kind of props, but I digress. <laughs> uh, what I really mean is polarization rotated optical feedback. OK, and again, that's better than OOF, I think, as an acronym for us. So very quickly, what, what do I mean by prop? Uh, really, I mean any mechanism that creates a time delay feedback or injection where the outgoing field then rotates to the, the perpendicular to the injecting field. Um, you'll see this sort of diagram a lot, and so the blue disks are going to represent the linear polarization state of, say, this beam. So this beam is horizontally linearly polarized, the one coming back is vertical, and so forth. And we'll look at several diagrams like that. Okay. Now, there are lots of ways we can configure a prop system, and I'll try to untangle which ones I think are most important for us. Um, we could have a system that creates rotated feedback from all outgoing states. So suppose we had an unpolarized laser, or randomly polarized, rather. We can simply re-inject it in whatever orthogonal, randomly polarized situation we have. Uh, or we could have something that we vary intentionally. Or we could simply select one state to feedback and rotate and leave anything else behind. All of those are the options. So the idea here, you know, this would be the initial outgoing wave a little bit later, a little bit later, a little bit later. And so this would be the initial return wave rotated by 90 degrees, rotated, rotated, rotated um, in that sense. Now, of course, here I'm preaching to the choir. I barely need to have the motivation slide up here, but I'm doing it for matters of form. You would crucify me if I didn't actually have that here. Right? So I have to explain, of course, that this is a, a 
fascinating system from a fundamental standpoint. Um, certainly, we could study delay dynamics in general by studying delay dynamics in lasers. Uh, alternately, we could learn more about laser modeling. I guess I jumped down here. We learn about laser properties. Uh, we could investigate the generalizations and the parallels to other similar systems with uh, the same structure and characteristics. Um, in the end, it's about being curious, creative, um, just a science. <laughs> <laughs> For our applications, of course, these will have some value. If we have chaotic signals, we could do chaos communication and free synchronization. Uh, we could do take advantage of the natural alliances between these lasers and telecommunications and digital optical storage. Uh, as you know, we can do, we may be interested in random number generation. Anyone in the back interested in that? Yeah? Okay, good. Uh, it turns out that the signals that we can produce in the square waves might be useful for driving up atomic clocks or for doing some kind of digital logic, conceivably, at least in principle. So, again, still looking this over, what exactly do we mean? How might this manifest in our laser system? Well, I, I do want to sort of deconvolve uh, prof with incoherent, because the language is a little tricky. Um, if by incoherent you mean unrelated to phase, insensitive to phase, uh, then something like optoelectronic feedback would meet that description, where you have your laser uh, detected by a, a good square law detector. It's not measuring the E field, it's counting photons, right? So you have a square there, um, and then you lose the phase. Uh, you could feed that back electronically to the pump current, and I mean, there, there are ways, or a variety of ways to do it, but that's one. Um, but in any case, this would be one set of equations to model it. You have a rate equation for the intensity of a rate equation for the carriers, and you see that feedback with delay arriving um, proportional to the power. This does have the, I guess, unless your microwave plumbing is good, you might have the side effect of not being able to capture the full bandwidth and have to deal with filtering, but in any case, that's one option. Now, if we want to consider doing this optically, that means we would interpret the system this way. We have our original picture of going, let's say, natural mode of the laser is horizontal. Return wave goes back to an unsupported mode, a mode that doesn't laze. Too much loss. So instead, the laser with that the field communicates directly through the carriers. But we just ignore the secondary field, well, assume it doesn't contribute in a meaningful way. Um, and so you can construct a rate equation that's essentially the same, or at least um, asymptotically it's going to be isomorphic with the optical electronic system. So it's a way of simply using the laser itself as a detector and affecting the carrier directly without paying attention to the field. Despite being 40 something, I still get a grandma off later to talk, so. There we go. Okay. Well, now suppose we have reason to suspect that we should account for both fields. Uh, then we would need to construct a more general model here. Now, I've already been uh, reminded in our group meetings that this is already a rescaled, uh, dimensionless version of the rate equations that perhaps you're more familiar with. So bear with me for now. I'll go back and start a little more thoroughly in a little bit. Um, but essentially, the crucial thing is you have now what I'm going to call the horizontal field. In essentially all of the systems I'll describe to you, the natural lasing mode of the laser will be horizontally related to the polarized. And that will be a TE mode, so I may say those things uh, interchangeably. I hope that's not too confusing. Then we'll have a rate equation for the vertically oriented field and the carriers. Uh, we have a delay term that couples the vertical field into the horizontal. We have a delay term that couples the horizontal into the vertical. And anything that were somehow in between, of course, we would resolve vectorally into the other. Um, and then they show up, again, in square terms in the carrier equation. Uh, we do want to indicate which one would come on in the absence of feedback. So you do that by the inclusion of uh, gain and loss terms, um, suggesting that the second field is the one with the greater losses. Therefore, without feedback, it would not activate. So the horizontal field would be the one that comes on. That would be our standard picture. Now, the main question is, are we? there, there are some things that are not included here. But is this necessary at all? Why would we work so much harder than necessary if the physics of the situation didn't require it? So I'll try to show you there are cases where um, both fields contribute meaningfully. 
Now, I guess the other thing I need to tell you about, well, a few more things, and then we'll get on to the data. Uh, but one would be how might we go about constructing such a system in the lab. And we have options, depending on our requirements and apparatus and budget. Uh, one might be, if I want to have a single laser system with prof, perhaps I have a Faraday rotator here. So it's, uh, you know, it's got the right Faraday constant, it's got the right wavelength. So we plan this out so that it will rotate 45 degrees through each pass. <coughs> so it goes through, rotates 45, reflects, rotates the remaining 45 in the same sense, and then goes back very good polarized. That's one way. Uh, we could do it with a wave plate, or we could do it with a half-wave plate or a quarter-wave plate, depending on our knowledge of the system, how we wish to do it. Um, if we happen to be in the lab that, for example, is described by Miguel only a few weeks ago, we might apply a Faraday mirror and do it through a nicely fiber coupled situation so we don't have to worry about threading the needle in free space through one of these bulky isolators. But in any case, those are all a variety of options. Now, if we want to do it more than one laser, we click the next slide. Suppose I want to have a mutual injection system, and that's something I'll show you. Well, now I need two such rotators because I don't get the double pass. So if I want laser one to rotate vertically to laser two, I guess two. Um, but now it's mutually coupled, so it would go back. Alternately, I can do some kind of combination where um, this will be something for a different talk or conversation. This would be more for a synchronization talk. Let's suppose this were laser one. It has feedback from itself. Now you put the uh, polarizers back on here and make that Faraday rotator into a bona fide isolator. Then I can not only drive laser one into interesting dynamics with its own feedback, but then inject that into laser two. These are all options. You could keep yourself busy for years doing these sorts of things. Um, I think it's, uh, several of us could keep ourselves busy for years, and several of us have and are. Uh, only one, one last set of variations to mention. Certainly what we expect to see would depend on the kind of device we use. I'll be talking primarily about edumating lasers, where there's a very strong distinction between the dominant mode and the unsupported vertical mode. Um, but if you are dealing with a pixel where the modes are much more similar, um, then you might expect some different kinds of results depending on the device. Uh, similarly, of course, we can, I mentioned this earlier, but this becomes my segue into the next piece. Um, we could feed back either all the output polarizations, as has been done in the previous experiments, or we could simply choose one, one orientation of feedback, and that will be the selective part. Um, so that becomes an important theme for us at this point. All right, so. Money after a single laser study is something okay. Am I talking too fast? No? Okay. All right. So let's consider how this might work for a single, a single edge emitting laser with selective crop. Probably selective crops aren't here. Okay. So suppose we have the natural horizontal mode. It emits, goes through the rotator. And I do want to point out now, I've actually taken this Faraday rotator and I've put a polarizer here at 45 degrees at the output end. That way, on the forward pass, it doesn't do anything. The laser, the, the light goes through, rotates 45, and passes on attenuate. Why is it there? Well, we still don't know. It reflects, it's still at 45 degrees. It passes through again, unattenuated, nominally. On the second pass, it rotates the vertical and is reinjected. Well, now suppose we are our two model or our two field model were correct, and we hit it with strong feedback, strong coupling, and in fact, this laser is stimulated to emit in its vertical mode, in its TM mode. What happens then? Well, it goes into the rotator, rotates another 45 degrees, and reaches this is extinguished. So this is one a way to again, at least in principle, guarantee yourself a single round trip, no echoes. It also guarantees that there's no feedback from the vertical back to the horizontal. So that's what I mean by selective. We only feed from the natural TE mode to the TM mode. We don't allow feedback the other way. We don't allow multiple round trips. Okay, that's the crucial message from this uh, cute little PowerPoint fade in and out animation. Now, of course, we want to look at both modes. So what we would do is we would slap in a non-polarizing beam splitter of some sort before we've gone through the Faraday, because that's going to select one of those, um, and then examine that beam in our detection pattern. So that's what we want to look at. I guess that's probably worth pointing out. There are a variety of ways we could control the feedback strength, since that would be an experimentally important and accessible parameter. Um, 
with a polarizer or a tight camera. Uh, whatever you do, neutral density filter will do. Um, the next thing we need to do is make sure we can detect this with polarization sensitivity to know which fields we're looking at and how they time out and what the relationships are. Uh, this is one way to do it. There are others. Uh, but simply, you know, you can imagine conceptually splitting this composite beam and then having one polarization at, you know, to pass the horizontal field, one to pass the vertical, and there you are. Then you can just pass it through a neutral density filter, make sure you don't destroy your detectors, and then amplify the signals and put them into the scope and see what you've got. See, now Constantine's smiling because he knows that I've done that. Blown up that detector, so. <laughs> Not here, yet. In any case, uh, just a few comments on the single diode laser. Uh, this is the Spectre Diode Labs laser that we'll be using. Uh, dominant TE mode edge emitter. I'm working in free space about 820, and the current threshold is 1819. Oh, okay, 1820. Right. Detection system, again, I feel you know, a little inadequate here, but I'm doing my best. Thing. Uh, we've got uh, AC coupled to a detection at 8.75 gigahertz. Uh, Broadband amplifiers in the scope. Okay, so that's, that's good enough to see what we're going to look at. Um, there's better out there now. That, that's what we're, that's the fidelity that I've got in the data that I'm going to show you. Okay, so first thing that happens, let's just examine what happens with the power. So let's measure the PI curve, power versus current, and let's do it for the solitary laser with polarization resolution, and then let's do it for the laser with prop, laser feedback, polarization resolution. So you have the characteristic curve here. Now I should point out, as I, as I just said this, obviously this was done with a, a laser different from the ones I just described to you, because that's not 18. Okay, so I've caught my own boo-boo. Um, but in any case, so the red line, here's your typical uh, horizontal mode. That's all that's happening in the solitary laser. In the solitary laser, the blue line represents the vertical. It is, for all intents and purposes, inactive. You know, 500 to 1, 1,000 to 1. Uh, suppression ratio. Now when we have the polarization rotated optical feedback, that TM mode comes up a little bit, becomes active. And the more, the stronger the coupling, the greater the activity. Uh, that power comes from somewhere and it essentially comes out of the TE mode. So what you end up with is a case where you're redistributing the power uh, from the TE mode into both through the coupling. Uh, the ratio should be roughly constant. The total power isn't supposed to change much. Um, sometimes we are going to rethink the things that we have uh, seen, but that's essentially what we expect to see. This little side picture is meant to illustrate what happens if you don't rotate the feedback. This is just normal coherent re uh, feedback where you slap the mirror in front. Now the threshold is reduced. Um, and so that's what you expect. Um, that's one presumably useful experimental test to know if your feedback is interested properly or not. Now suppose instead that we keep the current fixed for the laser but change the feedback from zero and up and do the same experiment. Well, if there's no feedback here, eta equals zero, coupling strength is zero, um, then the TM mode is zero, and then it grows as the feedback increases, which I'm characterizing here as a fractional round trip transmission in cavity. On the other hand, the TE begins at full power and decreases as you go. And depending on the laser you've got, those lines can even cross. You can have greater power out of the vertical than the horizontal if you drive it hard enough. Um, the other thing to point out is that you know, these are reasonably similar lasers uh, that I've, I've shown you, two separate lasers there. Uh, but their curves are different, uh, reflecting that they have some difference in their internal parameters. And so you know, that's another way of sort of determining. But in any case, between the PI curve and these curves, I hope it's at least compelling that we might need to take account of the second field. Using that two-field model might be a good idea if we want to describe what's going on in the system in these sorts of regions. Well, then we might start looking at dynamics. We've had enough of uh, simple graphs and PI curve. We'd like to see what's happening in time. So now I'm just going to look, or this is a, a sequence of increasing feedback strength, just time series, uh, just normalized power as a function of time. The scale is nanoseconds up to 20 here. You can't see it. Um, and you can see it begins at AC coupling, so I can't, I'm not showing you the, the DC level, but I'm just showing you the wiggles. Um, it's flat. You can begin to see 
oscillations or complexity, potentially chaotic behavior. Um, you can have a variety of different pulsating states. And then it's strong coupling out pops this polarization modulated square wave. Now, we, we have gone back and checked this. And here's a case where it's on and it's off. We, you know, we took a slower DC detector, we looked, and off is really off. It's not a little wiggle, it's the whole thing. It really modulates essentially fully. Um, so this is, this is going to be what we spend most of our time looking at and trying to understand um, what the characteristics are. So the first thing we might do is see how that uh, works when we do our polarization resolve measurement. So here I have that square wave regime in my single laser. Horizontal mode, vertical mode, simultaneously measured, and then we shifted to you know, scale up the detection path length and so forth. Um, but the first thing you notice is that, okay, you've got nice flat plateaus with relaxation oscillations at the onset each time, and each, and then the TE and the TM appear to be in very good anti phase relation. Right? When one is on, the other is off, and the two don't meet, but they fill up all the time being on essentially together. Uh, the other thing that you might notice if you've looked at, I mean, if you plot your little data analysis here, is that the period of this oscillation is actually twice the external cavity round trip time, and a little bit more, actually. Um, but let's, let's think of it as essentially governed by that. You can check that if you're not sure by changing the cavity length. And so here we've gone from a 40 or 39 centimeter cavity to something a little bit over a meter. The square wave has become much longer and larger and cleans up. Um, and so that actually makes pretty good physical sense. So the total intensity is zero. Hmm? Total intensity is zero in, this, in these cases. Constant. Constant. Constant right. or not, because you have minus one to plus one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's another factor of my, my ACD factor. Ah, I see, I see. Yes, we are. Yeah, so it's, yeah, so there's zero. Ah, okay. Right. Yeah, that would be, that would, there would be a paper in that, if I could. <laughs> 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 that could work. Okay. Okay, so I guess we've got, okay, so the key message is here. Uh, period is two, two tau, the waves are in anti-phase in polarization, so they solve much of I show this because, again, I just can't bear not to use a classical, beautiful Fourier case, uh, you know, nothing like going to the lab, doing something interesting, and then finding out, look, we can, you know, relearn Fourier decomposition of a square wave, and then you get the nice uh, decaying odd harmonics. Now, in this case, it's not perfect, even once come up. But in any case, it's just a kind of a confirmatory signature of what we're seeing. And then you see the higher frequency components uh, essentially governed by the relaxation oscillation time um, because you do have the relaxation piece um, built into P2. Um, just for entertainment, I'll show you that it's not always purely the square wave. In fact, we get complex signals that involve both the pulsating and the square solutions. Um, what's interesting is that they always come for the single laser symmetrically on either side. So you can have one, two, three. This is nominally a sequence of decreasing feedback as you go from top to bottom, but several of these solutions coexist. So I don't want to give you the sense that this is a smooth and continuous transition, but all these solutions are possible if you continue to randomize the initial conditions sufficiently. I guess it's a nice way to say block and block the game. Okay. The other side right here, I guess, is sort of cover the experimental results is we have tried this uh, with the Vixel at times. And again, the thing to keep in mind here is the polarization modes of the Vixel are much more similar. We don't see that same distinction between the two so much. And in fact, as you know, some of them are polarization bistable. So as you change the current, one, one becomes dominant than the other. So uh, we might expect this to have somewhat different results. Um, in square wave terms, we do. Uh, but I, what I need to tell you about this diagram Again, we're only looking at the time series as a single, but this is all at a single feedback strength. So this is firing on the, you know, just click, 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 click on the scope. Single triggers, same experimental conditions. Sometimes a short snapshot looks pretty good, like the one on top. Other times it's rubbish, like it is on the bottom, or somewhere in between. Um, the point is that it goes into and out of this. Uh, the waves are unstable, and and you can also see that I've okay, included the perfunctory RF spectrum here. You still have the odd harmonics, but now they're much broader instead of those nice narrow lines, um, showing that you've got a lot of slash and instability in there. Um, so the, the message here is that 
You do see it in pixels, but it's much more unstable. You can work to optimize it. Um, we found that you know, it was particularly current sensitive, but also did better for longer cavities. I'm not entirely sure why that is, but this, this will persist pretty well for quite a long time. But at the same time, if you change currents, what we've got, you know, now we've gone to a three meter long cavity, bouncing a few times up and down the optical table, which is you know, good fun. Um, a little bit of a trick to align, I guess. But then sometimes you get signals that don't look like they should. If these are not square waves, those are, you've got an extra plateau in there. And it's almost as though what's happening here, this is your horizontal mode. You get a pulse here, feeds back to the vertical. Sometimes the vertical shuts off when the feedback stops. Sometimes it says, okay, I'll just keep going. Uh, you don't have that immediate need to sort of go back to the off state and start again. So um, this is just sort of an interesting manifestation of what the pixels will do. In this case, what it really means is that if you want to have good square waves, you should really drive TE to TM and TM to TE. And there are other hazards, I guess, in doing that. Um, but in this case, you wouldn't want to do the selective cross. You might do better by driving both with each other rather than only driving one to the other. All right. Now, let's, I, I, I promised you I was reminded to actually give you a more physical looking rate equation model um, before we go. So, um, looking at the dimensionless version. So, let's go back again. We have um, rate equations for horizontal, vertical, and carriers as a function of time. Here you have the, the gains in the carriers, uh, the decays as you might expect. Um, and now we're going to include the I have this in my hand here. I feel the need to gesture. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I have a chalkboard in front of me, but too. Uh, but so there's your delay term. Uh, there is only one delay term indicating we've got the coupling from one to the other, but not the other way around. Um, we've got different gains included for the different modes. Uh, but in any case, now we turn this over to the twin columns, so I'm saying, um, and <laughs> to the rescaled version, or at least one of the rescaled versions. Like, you know, always have to be careful which one they're using. But now we'll rescale the times to the decay rate of the first mode. That was my hand. Okay. Uh, we will express the gain ratio. And they're just, what I want to, I just want to be good here, show you that when I show you the new version of the equation, this is where all the constants went. Uh, the feedback, instead of being R, will now be eta. We have a pump parameter now that's zero at threshold. And so you have a fraction above the threshold. So pump equals one means that you're looking at two times threshold, something of that sort. Uh, the fields are rescaled, but I'm just going to call me one and two, and Z becomes your carrier equation. Okay, so now we get back to the model that perhaps I showed you before. Um, crucial elements again, you've got the two fields, you've got the carriers. Here is your non lazing mode that's suppressed by its greater losses, and here you have the re -index. Well, now if we can toss that into your favorite uh, continuation method or you know, maybe cut or whatever it is you like, predictor corrector, and work on it. And in fact, such a model does produce square waves. Now these are uh, clearly much sharper on the relaxation oscillations on the turn on. Uh, but if we were to say filter that, uh, it might begin to look a bit more, or, or add noise, it would begin to look a bit more like the experimental data. But it still reproduces the crucial. Elements, right? You have the TE and the TM in antiphase. Period is twice the external cavity round trips, although that's not one. And so, hooray, the model works. Well, the period is growing in time. Hmm? Period is growing in time, no? Oh, it's, it's, like it's, it's just a little more than two times. Time, You're time right. seems to be growing. I think that's just the accumulation of, of additional bumps. I think I think the increment, say here to here, and there to there is, is constant. I'm not sure. I think the increment. I, I think the period is stable. As long as, yeah, I think I think they just sort of the accumulation, but we have to go back and forth. I think at the very end they might have some plausible suggestion for that. That might be. Okay. Well, the other thing we can do is try our analytics. So now we do our phase amplitude decomposition of the fields. Uh, and you end up with you know, this lovely mess. Um, 
but now we have you know, horizontal, vertical, phase difference, and carrier. Um, and now tau to the minus one is a typically small quantity, tau is large in this real version. So in this case, we can neglect the derivatives on the left as though we're doing a steady state calculation, essentially. And when we do that, you end up with, well, this equation becomes z times a h equals zero. Now, I may be an experimentalist, but I can do that one. And there are a couple of ways I can think of to solve that particular equation, right? Um, so we assume that there have to be two stages in this. We sort of anticipate that. One where we're going to insist that the horizontal mode is zero, and the other where we insist that the carrier is carrier number zero. And so you've got stage one and stage two. Uh, one where you've got horizontal on, vertical off, or horizontal off, vertical on. And the other quantity is sort of governed back into the past. If you were, were to sit down and really analyze those, um, the consequences of those assumptions, you can end up with a critical feedback rate in a diagram of this sort. It shows you first that there is, in fact, a minimum feedback rate um, governed by a variety of factors, um, the losses and the gains, as well as the alpha factor, that tell you that you don't see the feedback or you don't see the square solution until you get to a sufficiently strong level. Okay, so that's represented here, losses versus feedback. So if, you're, if, you're, if your losses are too strong or your feedback is too weak, there is no square wave solution. That one doesn't exist. Um, if you have sufficiently low loss or sufficiently strong coupling, then the square waves do exist. If, you, if they're both sufficiently small, there is actually a regime of unstable square waves where, or at least predictable, we've not observed that which suggests that in the lasers we use, we're at least coming across up here. Um, but one where the, you have those relaxation oscillations that turn on, and then they just continue to oscillate down again. But in any case, the, that, that's the single laser case. This is a good place to pause and ask if you have some questions about what we've done so far. OK. I have an experimental question. Um, yes. If you assume that uh, your coupling strength is, or coupling rate is strong enough to produce uh, such square waves, mm -hmm. and you still can't observe them, um, then that means that uh, your losses are, are, are too high, right? But if you have a very basic, very simple setup, maybe you, uh, uh, incorporating a Faraday mirror, what are you supposed to do to, to reduce the losses? I mean, I don't know. It's, it's right frame. No, no, it's a good question, and I don't know how you go about reducing the internal loss of, which is the material property of the laser, other than yeah. choosing a different laser. Uh, so you, you, you might want to investigate, it's something that would be very difficult to do with fibers, but uh, one way we tended to come across these, okay, quick experimental digression. I had a, the way I got my table to float at one point was using a mechanical pump. And every time it kicked on, there was a little surge and a little brown out. And until we properly isolated the uh, drivers, they would have a little drop too. So what we found is that it was sometimes the pump turning on to float the table mm -hmm. would produce square waves if the laser were on, but not in a square wave regime. So it essentially turned off and then turned on and woke up new and it sort of reset. Um, I don't recommend that. <laughs> as a technique, but serendipity is helpful sometimes. Um, but so in any case, it's a difficult question if you don't have access, because you can't really change your, those losses as far as I know. Um, and it's also, with the fiber, it's all the more difficult to randomize your initial conditions. Mm -hmm. that, that will scratch my head with you on that, so I don't know that. And the feedback uh, rate can't be too large. I mean, for example, if you use a 50% feedback rate, or feedback rate, that can't be too large. I mean, uh, it's either there, there, there should be no upper large. limit to that other than, no, I mean, there, there shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, presumably, if you were to amplify the signal, it's anyway stronger than it went out. I mean, if you're coupling more greater than one, mm -hmm. uh, you might get yourself into trouble at some point. But, but I don't believe there's a, you know, an upper limit that falls out of the analysis. So in that case, the stronger the better. All right, well, let's uh, continue on to our dual laser system. Uh, and part of the way we started interest, becoming interested in this was kind of imagining, how does that laser look to itself in the mirror? Right. So if you're the laser looking at the mirror, 
you see another laser in the mirror, an equal distance away. And so we could imagine actually physically manifesting that and just pulling up a mirror. And we would expect something similar. Now, this is essentially the same system as we saw, except what, what does the almost mean? Well, the almost could mean several things. It could mean that the laser is different than the other, in which case they will behave somewhat differently. Even if they were exactly the same, though, you still have a different carrier reservoir here and here. So you introduce an extra piece of freedom that the original system of the single laser doesn't have. So the question is then what, what happens in this case? Well, let's keep in mind we have to have rotated feedback both ways, and we want it to be selective. So now we have a rotator, a Faraday rotator with an output polarizer and a Faraday rotator with an input polarizer parallel at 45 degrees. So horizontal goes out, rotates, gets injected from laser 1 to laser 2 at 90 degrees. Laser 2, on the other hand, in its natural emission mode, also horizontal, will go back 45, get injected vertically. And then if either one is stimulated to emit in a vertical mode, it should be extinguished, just as the single laser was. So this is the idea. This is the implementation. Uh, it's a little bit messier to look at, so let me just guide you. The red heavy line is that linear cavity. We just bent it into a U shape so that it would be more experimentally accessible, um, easier to align and tune. Uh, and then we will just sample each beam before the rotator, um, the outgoing beam from each laser so that we can sample it fully in its mixed polarization possibilities, and then send them each to a polarization resolve detection. Uh, the way it looks actually on the table is something like that. Uh, here, uh, I've turned it around now. Get the laser over here, laser one, laser two. We're going through these big, big free space isolators. There's your beam. Amazing, you can see 820, I know. And then, okay, you can't, I'm just kidding. That's a line. Uh, and then we have the detection path here. So that's the flow of the logic on the table. Uh, I guess we've, uh, the same sorts of lasers as before. They're nominally matched, although not carefully matched. Um, the cavity length is about one and two thirds meters, giving you 5.5 nanoseconds uh, one-way time of flight. And again, so we have that selective coupling, but now it's neutral. And what do we get? Well, I'm going to go straight to the square waves this time with no further preamble. In laser one, you have the horizontal and vertical mode. Of course, there are other solutions. I'm showing you this one, but it's one of interest to us. Where they are in antiphase with one another, and laser two, horizontal and vertical, also in antiphase. Now, I've, I've led you down the primrose path here by showing you a special case um, where they, they look nice and symmetric like the other square waves that we've seen already. Um, but I'd just like to give you a moment to, to think this does make sense physically. Imagine, if you will, both lasers are off and you turn them on simultaneously. Both feel like a solitary laser, there is no feedback going on or injection, so you have the horizontal modes propagating out into the cavity. After one time, tau, both are vertically oriented and now become re injected. If that then stimulates it to flip to the vertical polarization, you see, so it started out here, now they both flip simultaneously to vertical. After one round trip, there's no more feedback because the vertical doesn't feedback, and so both revert simultaneously to the off state. And that's essentially the same explanation that we had for the single laser. Now, here's why it doesn't always work. Suppose you were to block it not in the middle of the beam, or not, suppose you have both on, or you suppose you turned on one and then quickly but not simultaneously you turn on the other. Then the feedback would reach at different times, and they would be out of phase somehow, um, and you might get something like this. At least that's one plausible question for it. So now we have somewhat different operating conditions, um, slightly weaker coupling. Now we have laser one has a long, plateau, long horizontal plateau, laser two has a short vertical. Laser one has a short vertical plateau, and the opposite is true for laser two. So now we have asymmetric square waves. Um, there are still some useful relationships here. Um, the, the modes within each individual laser are still in antiphase for laser one and for laser two. The other thing is there is a timing relationship um, that reflects that time of flight that leads to uh, self-modulation. So if we have, where's laser one? So laser one's 
horizontal mode turns on here. One time of flight later, laser two is initiated in the vertical mode, indicating that this wave front has reached the second laser and induced it to flight. Um, similarly, if laser two's horizontal mode turns on here, it stimulates laser one to drive in the vertical mode one time tau later. And so it's all self-consistent. The question is, how does it choose? How does it choose the duty cycle out of all of these possible situations? Is it just a matter of the initial conditions? Uh, is it the have to do with the laser parameters itself? Um, these are the questions. So the first thing you do is you go and you try to find out what the meaningful dependence is of, at least in the lab. And so one thing we find is that the asymmetry in the, in the square waves is smoothly tunable for, from a variety of different factors. So here I have just horizontal mode of laser one. So instead of looking at all of them at once, I'm showing you a sequence of only one mode. And you can see the on plateaus are just changing smoothly. Well, you, can, you can infer the smoothness from the diagram, right, which I've shown you six waves. But the idea is I've gone from the strongest feedback at the top, and then the coupling from smaller and smaller at the bottom. Um, this also implies that the square wave solution would be lost if the coupling became too weak. If this trend continued, eventually it would just go away to zero. Um, and we find that is indeed the case. It also implies that if it were too strong, we would lose it as well, but we can't experimentally access that. There are other dependencies by which we can tune the asymmetry. Um, another is the current of each laser. So not only if they're the same laser and they're matched, uh, you tend to be in a square wave regime, but there's a little bit of give on either side where you can still get to it. So here what I've done, again, it's a series just showing one laser, one mode. Let's say laser, we're looking at laser two's dominant mode. We'll fix laser one's current, and then we'll vary laser two's current and see what happens. Well, at a, at a, relative, at a somewhat smaller current, you can keep in mind that these lasers are meant to be reasonably well matched. At some minimum current, you still get something we can barely call a square wave, which then smoothly grows as we pump that laser harder. So the harder you pump the laser, the longer the duration of its dominant mode will be. Now, let's try the same, we'll look at the same set of data, but, ver but change the variation. Now we will, I guess we will hold laser two's current constant and vary laser one. Now if laser one has a weak current, what do we expect? If laser one's current is weak, we would expect it to have a short arm duration for its dominant mode, which means we would have a long arm duration for the other laser. So the weak current in laser one means that laser two will be long, and then as you increase the current, the reverse trend occurs. And that follows from that end of phase time. So, okay, we have that relationship as well. Also, just to point out, we have a variety of other solutions available. Um, they're complex, they're messy. I don't have a useful, insightful explanation for them other than to point out that they don't have to be symmetric like the single laser case was. Because you've got that extra three. Okay. I have, I have until four, do I have until five or four? Okay, you, you tell me when to stop. Uh, but so we have the, here, here's a, a look at some of the mutual coupling model. Um, it's essentially just two single laser prop models with the exception that now the delay term, this is, this is the horizontal mode of laser two being injected into the vertical mode of laser one and vice versa. So not only are you going horizontal to vertical, but you're going laser one to laser two and, and vice versa. Okay, that's reflecting the mutual coupling. I've also thrown in some noise terms because those become important. But otherwise, the structure is the same. We'll jump straight to the simulations here. And the good news is that the model produces asymmetric square waves that show the same dependencies. Now, I won't show you all the calculations with the dependencies, but they are there. You can change the coupling and it will expand and contract. You can change one pump current and will expand track. Um, the model also, if you eliminate the carriers, gives you um, an approximation that reproduces the timing relationship that we see where the vertical mode of well, one laser follows the horizontal of the other, uh, delayed by one time period. So that follows from the, from the model pretty, cl pretty clearly. Um, the problem with the simulations is that the square waves aren't stable. If you run the simulations for a long time, they inevitably uh, decay to a steady state, either just on or off. Um, so that becomes 
the next question. How can we understand what's happening there? Well, one thing that we've tried is playing with uh, injecting noise into the system. And so what I'm showing you here is a, we picked one laser and selected the duration of that on plateau. Um, and these are three different runs. That, that's not actually a time. That's a number of cycles, essentially, each successive period. And what we're measuring here uh, will be the duration of the on plateau progressively as, as the cycles increase, depending on the level of noise that's injected. So blue, green, and red, blue, green, and red, are the traces for increasing levels of noise. So for, let's see, for the blue, it, the duration grows a little bit, wanders around, then eventually goes down to zero. OK, zero is a nice steady state in a more square way. It's collapsed to a, a pure polarization state. The green, in this particular case, just wanders down to zero. Sometimes they wander up. Um, but then for other noise injections, it seems to stabilize it. This is you know, something that we're, st we're still trying to make sure we understand or even decide it's necessary. It may not necessarily be the case. Um, but this is also something that's known in other laser systems um, that noise can, in fact, stabilize um, these sorts of signals. So this is not unprecedented by any means. So it's one track to go on. OK. Let's see. OK, like we can play a little bit longer. Uh, we have, at this point, what do we have? We have nice experimental data showing a pretty clear set of dependencies for the asymmetry. Uh, we still don't have what I think is an acceptably full understanding of what's going on. And so this is the point where we take the model that we've built up as complex as possible and start trying to strip it down and say, OK, how can we get a hold of it at a somewhat simpler level? What are the necessary ingredients? Um, and so that, that becomes the next question here. Uh, the way we try to access this is through, again, the discussion of the steady states. So, of course, we'll take our equations, we'll drop off all the derivatives, and now the time dependence goes away because okay, steady. Uh, you get, I'm going to have to hurry through this, aren't I? Uh, but you've got a set of relationships between the amplitudes and the phases, and those sets of conditions admit two possible solution forms. Uh, one we will call mixed mode states where all four lasers, or all four optical fields, horizontal and vertical for both lasers, are simultaneously active and steady. And pure mode solutions where you have one laser that is purely on dominating the other, so one laser that is operating naturally, and it becomes just the injection problem. The other is getting a vertical injection in effect, um, but there's no, no reverse coupling. Um, here we go. Let's, let's have a look at those. So it depends like, on, on the coupling rate. So if the lasers are uncoupled, R equals zero. R and eta are still versions of each other. Well, I can look at that. Okay, so that's zero, that's zero. And ta-da, two solitary lasers. <laughs> okay, okay, that wasn't very good. Uh, let's look at the mixed mode states. In this case, we have neither laser dominated completely and all contribute. So you can take those equations that coupled together you have to solve and you can map them out. But you find that they're possible depending on this pumping ratio. If it's smaller than the ratio in this rescale form or larger than it if it's greater than unity, the solution is possible. The other case is the pure mode, which is where one laser is on acting as a solitary laser, the other is simply being dominated. Um, it's just the tea party out there. No, just... <laughs> That's not funny either. Um, <laughs> but here we have. If laser one is dominant, that means its vertical mode doesn't need to be on. It means that the other's horizontal mode can't be on. Um, and the other, you know, this is a solitary laser. It's z is equal to one, or z one is zero. You can solve it, and you get a relationship for the other remaining quantity. If laser two is dominant, it's the other case. Um, so you simply have one where one's on or the other, and that's it. We can map these out as a function of coupling strength. So if you have the TE and the TM for laser one, TE and TM for laser two. Here we have zero coupling, so they're just on or off. As you increase, you have all the modes simultaneously active, um, indicating that you are, in fact, in a mixed mode steady state regime. Um, in, in the end, as you grow, one grows, the other dies off. And so once you get past about this 0.05 level, you have the pure mode case. Here, TM is on and grows as the coupling goes, and it is off, and here, the opposite of this. So that's one possible um, 
turbine solution. We'll just keep going uh, to show you what I, I guess what I hope is going to be the last piece of useful information. Rather than looking at uh, how they evolve like this, what we'd also like to do is see how this steady states behave for both lasers at once. <coughs> so here we've got two pure modes. Here's it. Um, I'm going to say this clearly. Pure mode solution one is labeled here, one and one. Pure mode solution two is here, two and two. And here we're just mapping the horizontal mode of one, horizontal mode of two as a function of coupling all on the same scale. Um, and here you can see this is the curve we had before. The TE mode diminishes and goes to zero. Here the TE mode has a little dip that then comes back. But the solid dots are where the solutions bifurcate. Then they reappear out here. Right, this gap. So here's one half and here's, here's 1.5. Here the solutions reappear but they're unstable. So we, we presume they're there but we're not going to see them. Instead what we're going to see are the stable pure modes that should be there. Um, so now we have pure mode 1 appearing at this point, pure mode 2 appearing here. So they come on at different places as well. We have conditions on if those modes exist or in fact if they coexist uh, the message here is that if you have a, you have to have a sufficiently strong coupling for the pure modes to exist at all. Once that condition is achieved, you could fix one of the pumpings and determine the regions over which those two modes coexist simultaneously. And what, what you have is a case where the upper bound on the pumping for the for coexistence region will scale with P1, also scale with the coupling, um, and P2 lower will go inversely with it. So I'll show you two more slides of data, and then we'll be at 4 o'clock, and we'll have to stop, I'm sure. Um, so this is experimental data, where we've simply taken the lasers, uh, taken this very different pumping, you know, strong coupling, but different pumping, and then track that pure mode back, or track that pure mode up. So we, we, we begin the laser here, with laser two current very small, track it up, and we go all the way up here, well beyond laser one's pumping, before the mode falls apart. We can go out here to much higher pumping and track it back. So here's a region where only one pure mode is observed. Here's a region where the other pure mode is observed. And here's a region where they all appear, where they both appear. Interestingly, that's the region where the square waves are observed as well. So we only see the square waves in the same domain as the coexistence of the pure modes, suggesting that they play an important role, just as we had um, steady states solutions analytically that made a difference for the single laser case. Here we suspect we have to have both um, stable before we can get the uh, square wave picture in the mutual case. That's a good, this will probably be a good place to stop. Um, the other dependence that we have that falls out of the modeling is that, you know, again, these bounds of the upper and lower bounds for a given pump P1 do depend on the coupling strength. So if you have a high coupling strength, here I have a region of pump currents, um, two-dimensional parameter space, and you can see the, this, the red region is the region in which we observe the square wave solution, whatever the asymmetry may be. And if you have strong coupling, the pump currents can be significantly mismatched. As the, as the coupling diminishes, that region decreases, and before you get to zero, well before you get to zero, the solution disappears entirely, indicating that it's a problem not of the coexistence, but of the existence of the pure modes at all. That's a good place to stop. So, thank you for your endurance and your attention. And Please thank you for a very nice and entertaining overview. Um, we have only a few questions during the presentation. Is there more questions or comments? Actually, I have one maybe to, to start with. Do you? <laughs> Being inspired with the, with the title here, Reduced Problems. Okay. Um, how far could you actually strip it down to still observe the qualitative behavior? Because if you think of the two mode laser with the two orthogonal modes, you may say those are simply two damp relaxation oscillators. Mm -hmm which have two couplings. One is an instantaneous coupling, which is repulsive, and then you have a delayed coupling, which is attractive, right? Would that already be enough of ingredients to 
uh, allow for, for the square waves. That would be for the feedback case, and for the coupling case, you would have four oscillators, right? Would that already be enough to find uh, the essential features? I don't know. I, I, would, I would imagine that it is. The, the couple or the, the reduced models that we have, or that, that are looking in the subsequent slides, require a delay coupling and two steady states and initial conditions. That's essentially all. You see, so, the interesting aspect of that is that you may have, in other regions, you may call inhibitory or excitatory coupling, uh, and some of them are delayed, some others are not, and you may create different kinds of coupling situations in order to study that behavior. Because you have instantaneous couplings, which is all, uh, the ones in one laser, the modes, which are instantaneous mm -hmm. coupling, uh, and you have the delayed couplings, which are the, the, the cross-coupling. Right? Yeah. So I, let's see. I mean, I, w I, I don't know. I would suspect that that might well be enough if they have if, the city, if there are steady states that are possible, that seems to be an important piece of it. But it may be that you don't even need that much. Mm -hmm. Other questions, <coughs> comments? I forgot actually the dependence um, of the plateau length of the square waves on the strength of the noise in the system. The results you show, um, are those uh, numerical results or numerical results? Uh, numerical. Numerical. numerical results, yes. Um, how would you introduce extra noise to the system? I mean, the right one, so to speak? In, in the, uh, the physical system? Well, actually, actually I didn't include, the, there's a little video. Uh, again, you can almost do it by accident. I have a little, oh, I'll show you later. Uh, we filmed the oscilloscope in the square wave regime. And my research students jump up and jump down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the table vibrates. And so in a sense, you're introducing a variation in the alignment, a variation in the coupling. Um, it, you know, really crude, but as what you see is that the square would slosh back and forth. Now, you're not guaranteeing the level, but you are, you, you know, you're, you're essentially showing the sensitivity in, uh, because of course, anything you see on the screen has happened you know, 10 to 9 times by the time you, you see it. So over the course of several seconds, that thing wobbles back and forth. So you can see it governing the period in a sense, or affecting the period. Um, but that's, I mean, what else could you do? I mean, you could introduce additional noise in your pumping, or, or operating in a different pumping regime, and scale them up. Mm -hmm. Now let's thank uh, David again.